just take a moment and um, the language of the heart is a sigh. That's why so many of the sacred terms for the source begin with ah. So we'll just do a couple of ah. It's like a mini relaxation response that anyone can do at any time. Again. So this morning our topic is Wine and Psyche, Dionysian Transcendence and Madness. Oftentimes we do this event and we have it paired with wine and food with my commentary, the body poetry of Susanna and our friend Grant who plays flamenco guitar. Unfortunately, we couldn't quite talk the Creativity and Madness Conference into the wine and food pairings yet. So we're going to, this morning, begin to understand how to translate images and then through the lens of myth, neuroscience, and depth psychology, look and try to understand the Dionysian archetype, this instinctual energy in each of us, and try to make some clinically relevant comments about that. So I thought I was being very clever when I got the images for this, but I realized I didn't pick the images. Actually, the images picked me. So when we look at how to work with an image, whether it's arising in meditation or in a dream or an act of imagination or just we see an image in everyday life, there are three A's. The first is association. So, and we can thank Dr. Freud for this. So when I look at association, I look at an image like this, and I let it affect me in terms of my personality, in terms of my personal history, in terms of my narrative. Here's a, a young adult, it looks like, grabbing a sword, holding a sword, and looking forward into life. So when I looked at this image, it actually brings up memories of as a child at my grandmother's summer home, and there were these two magnificent swords, and my brothers and I would engage in sword play. It also brings up the association to, in college, taking fencing lessons. And it brought up images of swashbuckler Errol Flynn movies that I would watch with my father as a child. So as we look at association with any image with a client, whether in therapy or as a physician or in our personal lives, what is the personal meaning of this image? What personal things from my personal unconscious, from my history, does it bring up? How does it affect me on that personal level? The second A we can thank Dr. Jung for, and that's amplification. So when I look at amplification, I'm not concerned with the subjective field, with the subjective field, my personal. I'm concerned with the objective field, what this image is, what does it do, what is its function. And universal cultural myths or stories around that image will help me understand it. So when I think of this sword, a sword, when we look at a sword, it's a weapon to thrust, cut, separate. So a sword has to do with this instinctual, aggressive energy in each one of us. And in this case, it's not just a sword. It's a figure grabbing or holding a sword. So this figure is grabbing or holding, taking that sword to engage in the struggle, to engage in the fight of life. And it's like a young adult, the prince, becoming a warrior or becoming a king, taking this energy inside and marshalling forth. And that had particular meaning to me because I could sort of stay at home in southern Oregon and not take the risk to come out and marshal my assertive energy to give a presentation. So it's really one of my archetypal themes is moving from the prince to the king, to taking more ownership in my life. And this really represented that. And I thought of the myth of King Arthur. We can do St. George, who takes the sword to go off and fight the dragon, to fight the good fight in life, to fight the struggles that we all face. Or King Arthur, especially in the once and future king, the page, the young boy who goes, takes the sword out of the stone, and that's his first movement towards becoming a king. So that was part of the personal, the objective field, and I related that to my personal story. The last A is animation. In the first two, we're dealing with more that the conceptual brain, with understanding what this image is. In animation, I actually, I might even go into meditation and imagine this figure in the sword, and I might begin to engage in meditation in dialogue with that force. It's an embodied physical presence that's emerging from my left, emerging from the psyche. And so I then become into relationship with that. Perhaps I draw that sword and feel what that's like. And yesterday, I was a little nervous about the presentation today. Some of you might have seen me around Santa Fe. I was kind of going like this every once in a while. 
drawing the sword. And actually, that really helped. The other myths that come with are the Manjushri Buddha has a sword that cuts through the veils of illusion. And this image is from the uh, great source of images are the tarot decks. And um, everybody gave permissions uh, for theirs. So this image is from the Tarot of Transformation. And it's actually called the sword that cuts through illusion. And we also can see the Mahakali, who has a necklace of skulls, the severed heads of the ego, and a sword that severs the head of the ego. So not only was I taking my sword and moving forward and claiming my aggressive and assertive energies, I was also using that sword to cut through the illusions, my projections, my transferences, my fears and worries, all the illusions that come out of the mind. So that level of the objective field comes from what Jung called the collective unconscious. He believed we did not come in tabla rasa, but we had certain inherited organizing tendencies in the psyche, organizing instincts, organizing motivational systems that guided and shaped our lives. We could talk about our psychic DNA, organizing wisdom patterns in the psyche. So this is an organizing wisdom pattern in the psyche, and this is an image of Dionysius. It's quite a beautiful image, this beautiful man, sensual, free, with the grape leaves, with the, the ivy leaves around his head. So Dionysius, we want to look at a little bit, we want to amplify um, this image of Dionysius. And this is from the Osho Zen Tarot deck, and it's called Zorba the Buddha. So it's a little bit of a combination image, but I'm, I'm picking the Dionysian theme, not so much the Buddhist thing at this time. So Dionysius is a fascinating figure in our psyche that's been there through thousands of years of Western culture and civilization. So he's the god of wine. So wine is this substance that gets crushed, gets transformed, that affects consciousness. So already we know this pattern is going to affect our consciousness in a powerful way. He's the god of music, dance, ecstasy, which comes from the Greek ecstaticos, which means sort of mystical union, which is hinting that something a little bit deeper and beyond our limited egos and psyches, that we're going to get in touch with those aspects of when this image, when this archetypal image comes into our lives. And we never know an archetype directly. Like the bird doesn't know about nest building, it just does it. We know it through our instincts and behaviors, and we know it through the archetypal images that arise. So Dionysius also, in many of the myths and themes, Oh, he also represents ritual madness. So in this case, instead of being mad, in the old Greek rites, they would have these times of ritual madness. So all these chaotic energies could be expressed and organized in a certain way. He also often comes from some place beyond. He has, either has a triumphant return or an arrival from outside the known civilized area. So when we think about, we want to think about external and internal reality, the myth, when we think about it psychologically, means this Dionysian energy is pointing to something inside us, outside those civilized, conceptual, the neat little patterns and forms, those sort of rigid patterns that John talked about before. Dionysus is erupting beyond that. So it's a little bit of a scary energy in our psyche. And he's chaotic, dangerous, unexpected, everything which escapes human reason. And the last thing I want to say uh, before we get a little animation of, around this figure is he's called the twice born. Zeus has a dalliance with Semele, Dionysius is born, Hera is jealous, kills him, dismembers him, and then Zeus doesn't like this. And so puts him in his thigh, and Dionysius is reborn in some of the Dionysian myths. So there's a theme with this energy of dismemberment, and there's a theme of death and resurrection, all in this archetypal energy instinct of Dionysius. So now Susanna's going to do a body poetry to begin to embody and express some of this energy for us. What the High Priestess Says at the Temple Gates by Lewinsky. 
do not see admission here. If your world holds together and everything knows its place in your house, if the four walls have never fallen upon you and your living room furniture loaded out of a Sunday afternoon on the breath of some god. Do not pester me with inquiries or shine a light behind these veils. If the trees have never prophesied to you, to you, to you, or the deer, danced among the white clay men in your backyard. Do not, do not disturb my meditations if your sky has never ripped Open. Light cuts you to pieces. Or your head's not been cracked by the hooves of the bull god. How, how can my mystery enter how can my mystery enter So in the midst of Dionysius, he's often drawn in a chariot that has lions or tigers, or in this case, a cheetah. This is again from the Tarot of Transformation called Passionate Play. So if you take a moment and you just imagine yourself, we drop into that animation, we imagine ourselves as a cheetah. You can feel this raw, rippling, instinctual power and energy. But in the myth again, the cheetah isn't running wild at this point in time. It's harnessed. So this energy is pulling. So this instinctual energy is in the lead, is up front, is powering. So in the Dionysian archetype, we see there's a very, very powerful instinctual energy, cheetah-like. It's that place in all of us of this cheetah. And then uh, we were out the other night in the plaza, and um, for those of you who haven't been out there, there's the band shell, and they have free dances at night. And so, unlike a lot of places we go, a lot of people were dancing. So here was this Dionysian energy, alive in the Santa Fe Square, and we danced and had a great time. So, in the original Dionysian rites, there would be these orgiastic bacchanalia, that was the, the Roman term, of just crazed, because we have this instinctual energy, not only of music dance, but of fertility. So these Dionysian rites were taking place, and they were often with the second-class citizens who were the slaves and the women. And it was a way that they could celebrate their life energy and throw off the shackles of being oppressed through this ritual dance and celebration. And probably in today's world, the Western world, this is about as close as we'll get to the Bacchanalia, to these dance freedoms when our souls and spirits free and those energies are flowing through us. 
So when we think again symbolically, not only does the myth show throwing off the restraints of the oppressors literally, but psychologically throwing off the oppression inside our minds. Again, of those concepts of our superegos, of the judgments, of the collective pressures inside as well as outside. And this is um, uh, from the um, Gaian Turo. And in Euripides' play, uh, which is a beautiful source, you want to learn more about Dionysius, the Bacchia, one of the things that happens is the young uh, come in and they're not going to honor this god anymore. And so the message is, if you don't honor this god Dionysius, everybody who doesn't is either dismembered, killed, goes mad, or has a very bad ending. So it's saying this energy in our psyches is of crucial importance to see, to know, to understand. So this is from the Osho Zen Tarot. It's called The Mind. Um, This is what it's like for me a lot of the time. Hopefully not quite so much in those minutes when I get to center because someone gives me the privilege of coming into my office and then I can focus and let go of my stuff. So what we're going to do now is shift gears in a little bit... um, through the realm of neuroscience, we're going to look at, can we make any sense of this, from sort of the modern perspective, from the modern scientific perspective. And I'm going to look at, um, McLean was a neuroscientist in the 70s who came up with something called triune brain theory, and we'll look at it through left and right hemispheric functioning, we're sort of having that over and over again uh, this week. But McLean uh, postulated that there were three brains, not one brain. The first was the very base of the spinal cord, which he called the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain consisted of the brain stem, where these automatic functions happen of respiration, of heartbeat, and also instinctual behavioral energies are in the brain stem and the reticular activating system, which had to do with our level of consciousness, how alert we have or how asleep we are. And so when we look at this, we think of a reptile. And when we, we don't know the reality of this brain, if you've ever had a property dispute with your neighbor and you want to kill him or a car cuts you off in traffic, we can see this reptilian brain at work, at large, in our lives. So it's like a reptile. What does a reptile want to do? A reptile wants to eat. This is a good one. A reptile wants to mate. We won't show too much on, on stage. When we're getting that hierarchy, a reptile goes into these agonistic threat displays. And we can see that in our lives, and we can see that in national politics. My nation is posturing the right postures against the left, the left postures against the right. So we have these agonistic threat displays. Well, this is all part of this reptilian brain. It's sort of oozing around in the background, and we see politically, when we have these massive murders, massacres, we see that reptilian brain unleashed in the collective time and time again. So psychologically, when we're thinking about the reptilian brain, we're thinking about the belly center. We're thinking about embodiment. Am I resting fully as an embodied human being, at home and comfortable with these instinctual energies? Or am I frozen through trauma? Or um, am I impulsive? So many people with less structure are impulsive and act out all the time. They're acting out sexually. They're acting out with alcohol. They're getting into barroom brawls. So we're really looking at impulsivity, and so we're concerned with how are we going to help our patients manage their behaviors. Am I going to do that with uh, psychopharmacologic uh, restraints? Am I going to do that through behavioral aspects of therapy? But how do we help manage our impulsive behaviors? So this is really the domain of that reptilian brain. And for those of you who've seen the new Spider-Man movie, it's a complete, instead of being part of our psychic DNA, Dr. Connors is trying to splice in reptile DNA, and he becomes the lizard man. And so we have on the screen, if you want to see the reptile brain, just go see Spider-Man. Then we have what McLean called the mammalian brain. So here we have the wolves. We have this is called creature comfort from the Tarot of Transformation. We have the wolves there in this wolf pack, hunting, playing together in this nice group. We see the figure sort of drinking a wolf out of the cup, and we see these two people sort of lounging and relaxing. So what happens in terms of evolutionary biology is as we go up in complexity, there needs to be a longer gestation time not only in the womb but outside of the womb to learn crucial survival behaviors because the newborns 
are fragile. Whereas with the lizards and those sort of things, they pop out and they get eaten or they swim away. But there's there's no need for a um, maternal period where we're going to take care of the kangaroos. are going to put them in their marsupial pouch or the, the birds, those little things. You're going to hold the youngs in the nest until they're ready. So that's, the reptilian is kind of brutal. It's eat, get out or be eaten. With mammals, we need to develop an attachment between the caregiver and the young. So we begin to develop emotions to do that, the emotions of attachment, of love, of affiliation. And there can be audio vocal cueing. You know, hoo hoo, what a cute baby, but mammals and other things will howl, will do this, will purr, will, the cats will purr. So we see these audio vocal communications beginning to emerge. And then the other emotions when we need aggression and defense, instead of just that raw behavior, there are emotions of anger, of hatred of irritability, these emotions begin to organize too. So the emotional body is starting to organize. And then play is an incredibly important function. Because through play, just like the way we're all engaged in play this week at the Creativity and Madness Conference, we form a group. We form a, a tribe. We form a group affiliation. So play is a, a very lovely thing. And we also get to practice important instinctual survival behaviors. So I get to practice doing presentations. She gets to practice body poetry, we get to practice these things together, the way the little infant would take the, or the toddler would take the vacuum and practice vacuuming with the mommy. So play lets us learn how to cope with reality and form these wonderful groups together. So psychologically, we're concerned with the heart center. So we're concerned with emotions, the emotional body, emotional regulation. So is a person cut off from their emotions? Do they not have a sense of emotions? Do they not have a sense of relationship? Or are they flooded and drowning in their emotions? So this is all that heart center. So in therapy, we're concerned with therapies like emotionally focused therapy, the therapeutic relationship in therapy. This is where that relational field is coming and where we get into groups. So here's the emotional body. So that's what we're really concerned with, with the mammalian brain. This card is from, it's called Temperance. So the guy in Tarot, and here we're really into the neocortex. You know, this is here we're into I think, therefore I am. As our brains mature, we get this beautiful neurocortex. So we, we can not only be instinctual, we can not only be emotional, but we can think. So we can come up with innovative solutions to problems. We can think about long-range planning. We can think about consequences. And when we think about the maturation, as all of those of us who tried to work with adolescents the brain isn't finished maturing until at least age 25 in terms of these areas of long-range consequences and innovative planning and the decision-making capacities. So when we look at many of our world leaders, I think they haven't really matured that way yet. <laughs> and so in terms, psychologically, we're concerned with the mind and the head center. We're really concerned here with identity. Is there a sense of identity and a cohesive sense of self? Do I fragment? Do I have a sense of reality relatedness? So in the mental status exam, alert and oriented to person, place, time. So is my mind. So we're concerned with cognitions. We're concerned with the capacity of thought, of self-reflection, of self-recognition. And here, we could see with the mammalian brain, there was some freedom from the instinctual behaviors. We were once, my wife, my son, and I, at an um, African safari type place, and they were talking to them. The trainer was in with the tiger, and it was the mammalian brain. They were so affectionate. They'd been together over the years, and they were playing, and it was great. He said, if it is mealtime, and I got in between the stick and the tiger, I would be destroyed and torn apart. So you could see that reptilian brain would come out with the eating, but the mammalian brain and the emotional attachment was happening, but that was always ready to emerge. So we want to go a little bit into the neocortex, which, um, as we know, is not as just as simple as one. We have two brains in the neocortex. We have a right and a left hemisphere. This is called receptivity from the Osho Zen Tarot. And here we have a lot of the right hemispheric things. We think in terms of images in the right hemisphere. The water is the unconscious. So here we're concerned with the unconscious. We can, we're concerned with the right hemisphere with synthesis with eros, with joining together. We're concerned with um, um, poetic knowledge. 
And uh, there's a sense of attention to the body when we're dropping into the right hemisphere. We're more embodied. And we're much more spontaneous, much more intuitive, much more present-centered. There's a beautiful TED talk about a neuroscientist who has a left hemispheric stroke, and you begin to see this sense of integration, intuition, connectedness, present-centeredness, all coming as she knows, I'm pretty much experiencing pure right hemispheric functioning because the left is going out. And therapeutically, this is what uh, in depth psychology is called the way of creative formulation. So here I'm going to try to bring in the creative aspect. Poetry, dance, drama, music, all the expressive therapies. And I'm going to try to find a way to formulate what's inside and express this incredible intuitive functioning. And this really, when we consider the right hemisphere, and then we couple it with the limbic system, with the mammalian brain, and then we couple that with that reptilian instinctual brain, we now have the neurobiological substrate of Dionysius. Well, I haven't talked about Apollo left yet. I'm giving Apollo short shrift. Because our culture, I, I, I have not put this in for DSM-5, I think it should be in there. We have what I call RHDD, Right Hemisphere Deficit Disorder. And that's what we're faced with inside and outside in our culture. So here we have, this is called control from the Osho Zen Tarot. And it's really about the left hemisphere, which seems to be pretty much the domain of Apollo. So in the left hemisphere, we're with consciousness, we're with words, order, rational thinking, logic, logos to separate, to cut, analysis, psychoanalysis versus psychosynthesis. We usually don't attend to our body very much. We neglect it. We're up in our heads. We're really not that concerned with our bodies. And here, from a psychotherapeutic perspective, from a depth therapy perspective, we have the way of understanding. So in this case, we want to use this capacity. We don't want to say it's bad. We want to use this capacity to understand. So in analysis, we begin to understand our structures. We understand our cognitive schemas. How, whatever therapy school we want, we begin to understand conceptually, intellectually, about our structures, about our issues, about our problems, about our complexes. So we use this way of understanding self-reflection, mentalization, to begin to think about ourselves. And so this is really the realm of Apollo. And it's interesting, for those of you who've been to the uh, Delphi, in Delphi, we'll go to the myth now. We'll amplify a little bit. Apollo and Dionysius share the same temple. Dionysius is there in the winter when it's dark and cold and the water is dripping, meaning the unconscious. Apollo is there in the summer when the sun is out and brilliant and we're in that conscious, rational part of ourselves. But neither god is seeking dominance. They both share the temple. So if we look at this, Here's the temple of Delphi, here's Dionysius, here's Apollo, inside in each of every one of us. So we want to have these gods share this temple. And um, what happens is this, you know, the image, intuitive, feeling, instinctual part of the right hemisphere is under the control via the corpus callosum of the dominance of the left, which can inhibit and can repress. And uh, this is from Anthony Stevens, a quote, who has a beautiful book, uh, Archetypes Revisited, A Natural History of the Self, where he talks about a lot of these. He says, the rational, verbal brilliance of the left hemisphere dazzles and inhibits our awareness of events occurring in the intuitive, symbol-producing right. It is usually only when the sun sets in the left and the stars come out in the right that we become aware of our dreams fantasies, imaginations, and capacities to produce symbols rich in personal significance and meaning. So when Apollo's there, the personal significance, the meaning, leave. And the, the one thing I didn't say about that beautiful one is we're in the way of creative um, expression, creative formulation in that Dionysian image. It's what uh, Mrs. Baird talked about on the first day. We cut the educational things out of the schools. That's what gets cut first. But this is another beautiful quote. All children are artists until education and life knock it out of them. So,
Here we have a beautiful image from the Peterson Tarot. It's called the Mediatrix. And this is really what happens in, in good therapy. Here we have the, via the corpus callosum, the ref, left and right hemispheres communicate. So we, here we have the unconscious up here, the Dionysian part with the moon in the darkness. Here we have Apollo, the conscious, that way of understanding over here on the left with the light and the brilliance. Here we have that transpersonal place beyond ourselves, this place of transcendence above, coming down into the heart in the central figure who stands grounded in the earth in the instinctual body. So this is really the mediatrix, this process of holding, of integrating, of synthesizing all these aspects of ourselves, high to low, right to left. So this is what good therapy does. It can really allow a softening of the inhibition of the left hemisphere. And it can allow an integration and a containment when there is too much impulsivity, too much acting out from those lower centers, or when someone is overwhelmed by their dreams or fantasies, when someone might bring in a dream or a tidal wave comes and knocks them out. That would be the Dionysian that needs to be contained. Or someone's dreaming of an arid desert with no life. There would be Apollonian and some of that Dionysian life. That vegetative crown needs to come and new life needs to begin to emerge. And this is really the transcendent function in deaf psychology. And this arises when we hold the tension of the opposites. Whatever opposites are inside us or in our life is we're holding the tension of the consciousness and the unconscious aspects of ourselves. Then there's a natural self-regulating process in the psyche that happens. And then oftentimes this is experienced symbolically and a new sense of purpose, meaning, new direction comes from outside. It's that transcendent place from above that comes merely from holding the tension of those opposites. Now, since wine is the delivery agent, oftentimes, of Dionysian energy, one of the first psychopharmacological agents, I thought we'd start with a body poetry exploring some of the properties of wine. The Steam Bath by Jalaluddin Rumi. Steam fills the bath. And frozen figures on the wall open their eyes, wet and brown. Narcissus eyes that see enormous distances. And new ears that love to hear the details of any story. The figures dance like friends. Diving into red wine. Coming up and diving again. Steam spills into the courtyard. It is the sound of resurrection. They move from one corner of the room, laughing, across to the other corner. No one notices how the steam opens the rows of each mine, fills the beggar's cup solid with coins. Hold out your basket. It fills so well. Emptiness becomes what you want. The judge. I know why you're really here. You really just want to have fun. You don't care about your patients and clients. And the accused. Forget their sentencing. Someone stands up to speak in the wood of the table 
becomes holy. The tavern at that second is made of wine. Mm. The dead drink it in. Then the steam evaporates. The figures sink back into the wall. Eyes blank, ears just lines. Now, now it is happening again. Outside, the garden fills with bird and leaf sounds. We stand in the wake of their chattering and grow airy. How can anyone say what happens? Even if each of us dips a pen a hundred million times into the ink, how can anyone say what happens? So wine is the delivery agent of the Dionysian energy. And we want to look at its properties symbolically. This is from the Osho Zen Tarot. And uh, this slide is entitled, Going with the Flow. So when we think about water, when we think about a, a liquid, we think about the old alchemists, and their whole opus was in dissolve and coagulate. So it's this process of dissolving. We're in Brazil um, this January, and they have a beautiful term for dissolving. The word is dissolvendo dissolvendo. And so it's this property, alcohol, and as we associate to alcohol, for many of us it has a tremendous um, bipolarity. Because many of us enjoy, we like to wine taste, we enjoy it, we enjoy the mild effects of it. Many of us were raised in alcoholic households or have struggled with being overwhelmed or dissolving into alcohol ourselves. So on the level of personal associations, this primary psychopharmacologic agent, and it's funny when I have People coming into my practice, not funny, but people in my practice, when they come in and they're struggling with anxiety, it, 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 in the short term, I know why they drink. It works. It has long-term consequences and they can't stop it. But here we have, in terms of Dionysian transcendence and madness, alcohol inhibits the inhibitory centers in the brain. So the left hemisphere is inhibiting Dionysius. Apollo is sort of squelching him down. So when we have that one or two drinks that the mystics talk about, we can see that that Apollonian inhibition begins to soften and the worries and the cares and we relax and it's quite pleasant. And then we're in this state of going with the flow, what we just heard about, that sense of unfolding, of being in the flow. So that happens with that transcendent when we have a little bit of that Dionysian energy, a little bit of that quality of dissolving. But then when we have too much, we've had patients who come in who are literally flooded or dissolving in their emotions. This is when I began to become aware. I, you know, worked a lot in a gestalt fashion. I had one woman and she came in and she was dissolving all over the place and I realized I have to get her contemplating what's going on. I had to activate her mind. I had to get her mentalizing and reflecting because she was drowning in her emotions or perhaps someone's going psychotic and they're drowning and being flooded by not only impulses but thoughts, associations, concepts. So when this is to the extreme, then we're flooded and we dissolve. Now when we remember the myth of Dionysius, he dies and is reborn. So whenever someone is in that state of dissolving, what we want to ask ourselves and what we want to help them understand is, 
what are you dissolving into? Dissolve and coagulate. What's the new form that's going to emerge? What's the new movement in your life as you're dissolving? So uh, I contemplate this for myself, and I encourage you with those places when you're dissolving, what comes next? And we can see this in terms of our world collectively. The sort of the chaos it is a dissolving of old structures, but that's the moment of opportunity for new, healthier structures to evolve or to just disintegrate into Dionysian chaos and madness. So here we see the process of water, because wine is a water. It's called, alcohol spirits are called fire water. So symbolically, that metaphor is reflecting this fluid, solutio, dissolving quality of alcohol in Dionysius. And, uh, this is from Alex Gray, the visionary artist from his Sacred Mirrors book. If you haven't seen any of his art, I strongly encourage you to. So here's the red energy. Here's the survival energy. Here's the fire in the steam bath. Here's the heat. So now we're back to the reptilian brain, this instinctual survival energy. So we can see we have too much of that Dionysian delivery agent, too much of that wine. We get again into our barroom brawls. We're aggressive. We're fighting. That energy has overwhelmed us. So that's that sort of lower fire, that lower calcinatio, as the alchemists would call it. And in this energy, Alex has this fire spreading evenly throughout the body. So I'd say this person has probably done a lot of spiritual and psychological work or was just lucky. When we think about this image, I think about every cell in our body has the mitochondria, has the Krebs cycle. This fire of creativity, this fire of life is not just in our bellies, but is spread throughout. So the lower aspect of this fire is that aggression when the instincts run us. The higher is a bit that transcendent function and that field of consciousness, of light and intelligence that permeates the entire cosmos and that each one of us is a concretization, a focalization of that. And so in traditional terms, this higher fire was called the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen the beautiful Pentecostal paintings of Jesus of the, after the disciples? These tongues of fire are coming down. So psychologically, that would be that transcendent function when this new emerges as we hold the tension of the opposites. So we can see the transcendence, we can see the madness when we're overwhelmed. And here, this is from the um, Tarot of Transformation. It's called Healing Sexual Energy. But this would be my patient, Mr. T who is in his late 20s. He comes in, if I was going to give him the diagnosis, uh, number four in Dr. Graham's work, but I'll start there since I was you know, filled out for an insurance company. He has mixed substance abuse disorders. And this is Mr. T in a nutshell. We can see his fires are outside of him. He is fragmented and overwhelmed in his mind center. He's flooded and overwhelmed by his emotions. This, if I had an image to pick of him, would, which is why I picked this image. So Mr. T, as we look at him a little bit more, he is Dionysius embodied. Now, what happened with me as I'm listening to his stories is in my counter-transference, I'm getting a little jealous. You know, I had a fun time when I was young, but logarithmically less than Mr. T. I mean, his use of substances, he's a grower, not surprisingly. He's a musician, not surprisingly. I wasn't that jealous of. But his sexual escapades, his Dionysian orgiastic, bacchanalian excesses. I am keeping a nice persona of a therapist, but inside I'm going, damn, that would have been fun. <laughs> so to understand Mr. T a little bit more, we want to understand the complexes. So the complexes are these bundles of emotionally charged impressions. We can call object relations. We can call them complexes. We can call them cognitive schemas, whatever we want to call them. So Mr. T has this sort of tough, hard-ass father comp. So this aggressive, dynamic masculine energy is coming in, overwhelming him. His mother is anxious, worried, and is alcoholic. So there's no container for this energy, too. So there's no holding being, the doing is out of... And then he's a very charismatic, nice guy. He's sort of the golden boy, the golden child. Everyone loves him. So he's a perfect, ready-to-be-inflation. He's never had to deal with reality. So here we have Mr. T. Now, when we're in the grip of an archetype, one of these energies, when we're out of balance, there's a natural self-regulating function in the psyche. So oftentimes that'll come up in dreams. Sometimes it comes up with the fates in our everyday life. So for Mr. T, to give you an example, he, when the fates first started to say, stop, you need to get a little more Apollonian, he's at a party, and he's waiting for his lady friend, Miss A, who's coming. But he spies another 
a young Menaid from the Dionysian orgiastic Bacchanalia, and since he's Dionysian, his impulses override him, and I don't think he's going to wait for Mrs. A. Ms. A. So, but he, there's a problem. He, little Apollo in there, he knows he needs to get a condom, so things progress, and eventually Mr. T is running nude through the party, searching for a condom. So here we have Dionysius at play in the fields. Now, he runs into the sacred moss garden where he trips and falls on a bundle of quartz crystals and an angel of mercy statue and breaks a rib. He comes into the session a day or two later and says, I think I need to begin to stop and slow down a little bit. <laughs> so he would come into therapy, and the biggest thing what we're doing with someone like Mr. T is, this is called grounding for creativity from the same tarot. You can see the fire is now in the belly. It's contained. It's not outside. He's not fragmented. The fire can then be sublimated, can be transformed and go into his creative expression, his unique path in the world, and he's in touch with that transcendent function rather than those bizarre, chaotic manifestations. I don't think I was very brilliant with Mr. T. I think I played a little role in that. It was a little bit, as much as I didn't like it, I was a little bit of Apollo in there. And that happened, I think, more than what we did in the session, the fact that there was this regular time with someone like this, the less structure there is, the more structure I have in therapy. So we had a regular time every week, same time, same day. And it was a struggle for him to get there. That was really the challenge. And I think that began to create a little bit of structure, a little bit of containment. So then he'd go on the wagon, he'd relapse into using, and then he'd come back. Eventually he began to go in a treatment program. First of all, a bit of sort of a sort of out there new age treatment program. But then eventually he went into a more traditional, because he needs that Apollonian energy, a very traditional. He dropped out, he did pay his bill before he dropped out the last time. He developed enough respect, so he dropped off probably high the money he owed for his missed sessions. And um, that was the end of the story. He sort of disappeared, and I saw him a week before the conference. This young man comes up to me, who I don't recognize, and he says, hey, doc, and it's Mr. T. He has shaved off his natty dreadlocks. He's rejoined the worlds of sort of the roundheads and the adults, and he's been clean and sober for nine months. So he's begun to integrate. So I think I had that little putting little pieces of Apollo in him, little bits of reflection, little bit of structure, little bit of this grounding to hold his creative energies. Mr. B, however, if we look at the bottom figure in there, that's Mr. B. He is down. He's in the earth. He's too coagulated. He has too much rigidity. He has too much form. And he would have had the diagnosis of 300.4 mild depression. So he has a failed alcoholic neglectful, rejecting father complex. He has a neglectful, rejecting mother complex. With each one of these, he just sinks down further and further. He didn't feel like he fit in his family of origin. He has the sense of being an outsider. That's really his primary thing. And he became a good boy to try to compensate and try to make up, and he would lose any sense of himself. So he's sort of the lost prince, and so my work is to help him find that king. My work is to help him get in touch a little bit with this Dionysian energy. So some of it comes from the eros, the relational field, the very real, alive relationship in psychotherapy. I also encourage him, and he begins to join a group, one of the groups we lead, where he works very much with the sense of being an outsider. In the group, there's meditation, there's music, there's dance. He begins to get a little of that alive energy. He begins to play his guitar a little bit. So he's becoming alive a little bit by a little bit. Now, his dreams, interestingly enough, have the compensation. The Dionysian energy we begin to see in his dreams. He has a series of one dream one night, and in the first, he's at the butcher's office. And the butcher is there, and he's cutting up meat. Here's that Dionysian dismemberment again. And he's feeding Mr. B raw meat. The next phase of the dream, he's sitting there dissecting small animals. This raw, aggressive energy is coming out. Dionysia is saying, it's time to be dismembered and reborn. And then the third part of the dream, he's dismembering a little boy and cutting him up. Now, he also begins to get the Dionysian sexual energy. His wife is often in, in the dreams, and they're both going out, his female self, they're both going out and they're beginning to get a little titillated and they're beginning to get attracted in the dreams and they're beginning to flirt and they're beginning to get a little more into their hips and pelvis and they're beginning to approach 
that sexual union, sexual dalliance is beginning to happen. He's entering the Dionysian Bacchanalia in his dream. Psyche's saying, hey, there's something underneath this. And then he's also sent, oftentimes, to find mysterious beverages. So the Dionysian delivery agent, he's going down to bartenders looking for these drinks with these exotic names that I've never heard of before. The Dionysian energy is saying, hey, drink me in. Come alive. Don't be dead. Don't be one of those figures from the steam bath that's dead on the walls. Drink that holy wine. Drink that energy. Come alive. So here's a lot of the work. This is called the Thunderbolt from the Osho Zen Turo. And it's a beautiful image. Here we have the life in our world today, these incredible fires and thunder and chaos and upheavals that are happening. And here's this incredible fire inside. And I like to think here's the person's mother and father complex hurtling down. Traditional Tarot, this would be like the tower. And so really today when we're looking at evidence-based, I mean the Buddhists have known it's evidence-based for 2,500 years, but now we can say it's evidence-based too, is that quality of mindfulness. Because in the background is this figure meditating, building in analytic terms the observing ego, in contemplative terms, the witness. This quality through therapy is beginning to be built so that Mr. T could withstand the external bombardments and allures and could contain the internal fire. And Mr. B could become, through this quality of mindfulness, through this quality of awareness, could become aware of the internal fires and passions and energies and find ways to express and enjoy that in his life. And this, I think, is, is so much our work. And I think in a way that um, good psychotherapy is in a way a meditative practice. And what we're suggesting, we're usually given two options in our lives. We can either repress something or we can act it out. And usually the way the cycle goes, I repress it. It's in the unconscious. It's ten times more powerful. And then it bursts out and I act out even more. Then I feel bad and I repress. So Apollo, Dionysius, Apollo, Dionysius, Apollo, Dionysius. It's kind of what happens to many of us and many of our patients. But in this, there's another option that's been given, and that's allowing. When we can form that container, we can allow the instinctual energies without being overwhelmed so we're alive, and we don't have to act them out. So, so many of us, you want to begin to think about allowing your internal states and helping your clients and patients allow their internal states. So as we move to our last piece to try to tie it up and form a little more relevance for ourselves and our clients, we'll start with another animation and body poetry. Advice does not help lovers. They are not the kind of mountain stream that you can build a dam across. An intellectual does not know what the drunk is feeling. Don't. Try to figure what those inside love will do next. Someone in charge would gladly give up her power. If she caught one whiff of that wine musk from the room where the lovers are doing who knows what. <clears throat> one of them is trying to dig a hole through a mountain. One 
is fleeing academic honors. No PhD for me. One laugh at famous mustaches. <laughs> Life freezes. If it doesn't get a taste mm, of this almond cake, mm, tried it lately? Mm. Ah, the stars come up spinning every night, bewildered in love. They grow tired of that revolving. If they weren't, they'd cry. How much longer do we have to do this? God picks up the reed flute world and blows. Each note, a need that comes through one of us, a passion. I love dance, a longing pain. Will I fulfill it? Remember, remember the lips where the wind breath originated. And let your note be clear. Ooh, don't try to end it. Be your note. Be it. Be it. Be your note. I'll show you how it's enough. Go up on the roof in this city of the soul. Let everyone let everyone climb up on their roofs and sing their note. Sing loud. So the last image is awakening, and I think that's what Rumi and Susanna are really encouraging. What, what my real message is, it's this process of going inside each one of us before we even go on to our patients, clients, going inside each one of us, finding this place of balance. Where inside am I a little too Apollonian? Where's that healthy Apollonian? Where am I a little too Dionysian? Where am I dry, desiccated, where there's a desert? Find a way to balance that in our lives. Let's not just try to put education back in the schools. Let's just not try to put creativity there. I encourage each of us to find a creative expression. As one of the other speakers said, don't worry about it as a performance. It's an expression of your soul, of your depths, of your being. Find poetry, music, dance, drama. Write, draw, get finger paints, get together with your kids, your grandkids. Find ways to express your creative life force. We have that place of work, which is very Apollonian. Play, which is that mammalian brain. Creativity and love. Love, again, that attachment. Find ways to balance out those four segments of your life. So find creative expressions for yourselves. As you balance those right, left, the Mayan instinctual centers, as you become alive, balance, integrate, then the ability to do that for your patients and clients is natural, becomes effortless. You become that place of transformation in yourself, of awakening, where all the opposites are held, the men, male, female, the above, below, the transcendent function, this emergent self comes. And never in the history of the cosmos has there ever been a unique, precious being like you. And there never will again in the history of eternity. Each one of us are precious. Each one of us are unique with our individual temperaments and endowments, 
our individual impressions and conditioning, each has a unique voice. So it is about finding your individuated expression, finding your unus mundus, finding your path or deepening into it, although we've all been on our paths, whether we know it or not, but finding that place and refining into it. I guess I'm a little more experiential than conceptual to refine it over and over again. And that leads us to the last slide, just take that in for a moment. From the Torah of Transformation. It's called Healing the Planet. And really, as each one of us as a cell on the planet find that way to integrate and contain, it allows to that larger healing in the collective. And we have these image of the dolphin. And I've been animating and playing with that. So rather than saying anything, I will encourage each one of you to find ways to animate, to come alive. And in your healing, is the healing of the larger collective and the planet. Thank you very much.